Let me ask you to join in a silent prayer. And we're going to be talking about praying with Jesus. We're going to be kneeling beside him a little bit here and hearing what he had to say. Uh, first with the disciples about prayer and the privileges of that. And then as Christ himself spoke to the Father and, uh, and prayed, what could we learn by listening to Christ about prayer? Let's ask God to impress this message on our own heart. We're dealing with praying with Jesus. And we'll be looking at John chapters 14 through 17 not intensively every verse, but we want to look at it. In the first part, we're going to be praying in Jesus' name. Praying in Jesus' name. And we'll check passages from uh, chapters 14, 15, and 16. Now, this is the phrase that we often hear, and people are closing, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, or in Jesus' name. The first passage we want to look at is uh, he's explaining this to his disciples. Point A, glory to the Father through believers' greater works. Through believers' greater works. Now, what is that talking about? Well, let's look then at John 14, verses 12 to 14. Jesus said, verily, verily, this is the word, by the way, amen. When it's at the end of a sentence, we say amen. If it's at the beginning, we say verily. Both of them mean it is true. So here, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, got saved, the works that I do shall he do also. Uh, the works here, he's pretty much talking about the preaching and the miracles and the whole business. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. And, now here's the phrase, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name. Now that's whatsoever ye shall ask in my name. That will I do. And why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, what is he talking about? Well, we see, first of all, believers doing the works that Jesus did. And that, of course, is shown true in the book of Acts, full of examples. We were talking about some this morning in Sunday school. The book of Acts is full of examples of the apostles and others. Uh, Philip was doing uh, miracles. Stephen was doing some miracles. Apostles and others performing miracles of healing, even of resurrection, other amazing things. Today we find that answers to our prayers are often miraculous in timing and power. So um, we aren't too surprised that the work of Christ continues. The book of Acts, written by Dr. Uh, physician uh, Luke, said, he titled it, um, I wrote earlier in, in the Gospel of Luke all that Christ began to do and teach. And now in the book of Acts, by implication, he's, doing, he's say, he, telling us the things that Christ continued to do and teach, but now through the apostles. So believers doing the works that Jesus did. It's a, a pretty interesting concept to realize that when we speak the word of God, when we speak to others, uh, sit down with them and reference uh, the gospel and try to talk uh, to them about getting saved and understanding how to be saved, that we're doing the same work that Jesus did and that he understood that. The second thing we notice is that believers are doing greater works than Jesus did. Now, as I was reading it to you, perhaps you noticed, he seems to indicate the idea of greater works has to do with how long he had on earth to do his great works because he says, because I go unto my Father. So Christ works. We, we figure his ministry, actually ministry, from the baptism to the crucifixion was something over three years. Uh, so uh, that was a rather limited time. 
So many of these other uh, followers lived long lives. John was a teenager, uh, perhaps, as he began to be a disciple and lived to long age, uh, actually probably carrying the Christian age to uh, 100 A.D. Uh, when he died, when he was killed, murdered. So, even greater works. Not, not that uh, one resurrection would be greater than another. You know, I don't know how you would evaluate that. But uh, greater in that there would be many more. All right. <clears throat> the third thing that we see here, and this is the key to what I'm trying to get at here, is believers receiving anything they ask. Now, because he says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Now, many have considered this promise to be a practical difficulty. <laughs> because, look around, obviously, Christians do not receive anything they ask. You can imagine what would happen if everybody got everything they ask. Somebody would want it to rain on their crops, and then the next person would want it not to rain on their picnic. You know, I mean, it would just be an impossible situation. We remember that even the Apostle Paul tells of the time that he prayed three times for God to remove the thorn in his flesh, but was told no. He did not receive anything he asked. So, what's going on here? Is this a problem? Well, the key is, the phrase, in my name, is that key to understand what this means. Now, this is an important thing for us to recognize. And we're talking about the message of prayer itself here. What does it mean to pray in Christ's name? And are you, when you even if you say it, are you praying in Christ's name? Not necessarily. Uh, so let's look at what this means. <clears throat> the best, I think, example of asking and speaking in the name of someone is when David sent his young men uh, to ask Nabal, a rich man. He said, we've been stationing ourselves around Nabal's fields, and because we are something of an army, we have been protecting him, uh, you know, random sheep stealers uh, haven't made it through our army, so we have helped him out, we've kept his flocks, so I want you to go to him, you young men, and ask in my name, David's name, uh, if he will give us some food. Uh, help feed the army that's helping him. Now, we find in the story that Nabal said, uh, oh no, oh no, oh no. And his wife said, well, that's because his name is Nabal, which means fool, and he is one. <laughs> so she usurped the authority of her husband and uh, made the deal with David. And then when Nabal found out, he had a heart attack and died. So uh, she didn't help him out at all. All of that to say, when he sent them, he said, speak these words in my name. Now, this is the same precise concept that Christ is telling us if we ask God in his name. What does it mean? Let's look at the passage in 1 Samuel 25, verse 5, and then verse 9. David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, Mount Carmel, that's why he's going up to it, and go to Nabal, the rich man, and greet him in my name. Now the Hebrew is more literally, ask him in my name of peace. So I come to you in peace, and I'm asking you to do something for me. Then verse 9, When David's young men came, they followed his rules, they spake to Nabal, notice, according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased, that is, rested. They stopped. The implication here is they were told to ask for supplies in the name of David. They were not authorized to ask 
anything for themselves. Yeah, and then David would like a bag of gold, and you know, and no, they didn't do that. Only what David had told them. They were they were facilitating the program that David had envisioned. You see, he was providing a service. He had not been asked to provide the service, but he had provided safety for the flocks. He was a shepherd himself, and understood uh, that could mean a lot. But um, he wanted them to ask for certain things, and that was what he gave them the authority to do. So Christ's reference to asking in his name means telling uh, others are doing what God has commissioned us to do. Now, I found that asking Christ's reference to asking in his name was prophesied long before to Moses. I was surprised to find this. Um, this set the stage here. When God promised to send Israel a prophet like unto Moses, he was talking, <coughs> excuse me, he was talking about Jesus Christ. Moses, if you remember, God used him as a lawgiver, as sort of a prophet. He also used him, uh, he, he gave the priesthood to his brother uh, Aaron, but uh, the whole idea of, of bringing people to the Lord, uh, that was a priestly work. And then he was a ruler. He was never called a king. Moses was never called a king, but he was certainly the ruler. So he said, a prophet like me will come and <coughs> when he comes, you Israel need to listen carefully. So uh, God told the people through Moses that they should listen carefully to that prophet. And then he reminded them that they had asked back at Mount Sinai, they had asked not to hear the words of God himself at Mount Sinai. This was a scary thing. Here were the people just fresh out of Egypt. They were slaves. They weren't treated very nicely. They weren't given great education. <coughs> but they come before this mountain and dark and smoky and thunder and lightning and earthquakes and stuff going on up there. And then this voice, the very voice of God speaks. And they said, that's scaring us to death. We just don't. We don't. Look, look, you talk to God and then you tell us. What were they asking? They're asking for a mediator. See, we don't like this God talking to us thing. Too scary. You speak to God. You got a handle on this. And then you speak to us. So they wanted a mediator, see. They wanted a mediator between them and God. So God spoke then of sending Jesus as a spokesman for God the Father. Here's the passage, Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19. I will raise them up, God says to Moses, a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. So we see the parallel between Christ and Moses. And will put my words in his mouth. Uh, sometimes we think of Jesus all by himself. We think of him as giving his messages. But if you listen, if you read through the Gospels, you hear over and over again Jesus saying, I'm, I'm saying what God gave me to say. I'm doing what he told me to do. And that's all. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever that whosoever, I'm sorry, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him, of the one that doesn't listen. He says, if you don't listen to him, you're not listening to me, and I will require it of you. You'll pay for that, you see. And of course, Israel did. They rejected Christ's message, and they were not acknowledging that what he said, he said in the name of God the Father. They pretended to worship God the Father, but not this, this uh, Messiah of Jesus. Um, but Christ was speaking in his name. Now, he says, if you ask anything in my name. That means, if, as, as the, uh, last week we were talking about the Lord's Prayer, he urged us to pray 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is saying, God, I am with you in your program. I want your program to succeed. I am working under you, your will being done, to establish your kingdom. See? So God's program, Christ getting this thing done, he told us what we are to do. He said, go teach all nations or disciple all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to do all the things. Now, if we are praying about accomplishing needs to accomplish what he commanded us to do, we are then praying what? In his name. We're following his program. That's what it means. So Paul says, I got a thorn in the flesh. I'd like it to be done. He says, not part of the program, Paul. Not part of the program. You can't pray that in my name, see. Uh, that's, not, that's not part of the program. In fact, you having the difficulty is part of the program. So you being thorn-filled, <laughs> and being as successful a preacher as you are shows that it's the power of God and not of you. And so Paul said, oh, I get it, okay. Bring on the thorns. Give me more thorns. That's fine. All right. So what is he saying? Christ here guarantees an answer to prayers Ask to accomplish the works he desires to glorify the Father. Again, when Christ talks about salvation, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. See, salvation is actually trying to get to God the Father. Christ is the path. The, uh, the way the words are used in the Greek he says, I am the way. When he says, I am the truth, he means I am the true way. And I am uh, the way, the truth, and the light. I am the living way. Let's see. These other two reflect back on the idea of being the way. Now, he says, that's the program, and this is all to the glory of God. Everything I'm doing, even giving my life to pay for your sins is done to bring glory to God. How does it bring glory to God? Because it shows you that God is love, and he loves you so much he would send his son to die for you. And that reveals his essential character, that God is love. All right, the fourth thing that he says here is that believers granted requests glorify the Father. He says, I understand that by guaranteeing that you do, that you have all, the, all that you need to accomplish my program, the Great Commission, that will bring glory to the Father. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. The word that often means for the purpose that. For the purpose that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He says, even now that I'm going to die and raise up to heaven, even now the work that you continue will be me guaranteeing that glory goes to the Father. So all through the Gospels, Jesus emphasized his goal was to do what the Father gave him to do, to say what the Father told him to say. So his great works were done to call attention to the power of the Father. And the message of the Father about offering salvation through the work of the Son. I'm here to facilitate the program of God the Father. And you will continue that for the glory of the Father, and I will facilitate that by giving you all that you need for the program. So this passage from chapter 14 uh, grants us the uh, image of what this is all about, this uh, whatever you ask, it's not anything you can imagine. It's not a genie. You, you rub the lamp and you have three wishes. It's not what this is. So 
if we are sick, if we say, uh, I would rather be well, you can't pray that in the name of Christ. See? Um, sometimes the purpose of God in giving you an illness is to take you home to heaven. Most people will die of an illness. Uh, some die in a car wreck or something like that. Ten ton safe falls on them from an upper story or you know, just things that happen you know, breaks you all to pieces. But most often we get sick and die. So uh, that could be the will of God and therefore you're praying not for it to happen isn't part of the plan of God. So um, let's make that distinction as we pray. It may be that I would be better off praying, Lord, I'd like for you to be, able, I, I would like to be able to preach one more time. <laughs> so if you would heal me, I can do that and get the gospel out to some other people. You see. Uh, now I'm beginning to look at my value to the program. Not that, not that I have any special value, it's just that I'm contributing to that program. If we ask God to bless our food because we like food, that's, that's not to the, in the program here, see? That's not God's program. But if we ask for God to bless the food to the nourishment and the strengthening of our body that we might be better able to serve God, now we brought it into the programming of God. And uh, we're more likely to see an answer to that prayer. All right, the second passage is, comes from chapter 15. And here Christ is explaining glory to the Father through fruit bearing by believers. Now we know the idea of bearing fruit. We've seen my uh, wife was pointing out to me we have a a tree that grows by the deck at the back of our house. And we've watched the birds come in and eat the berries. They, sometimes they get up on the branches and peck it off. And a lot of times they're pecking a bunch of stuff off without trying to eat it so that they all gather down on the deck and eat all these berries. Well, the tree is at a point where it has lots and lots of berries, but I guess they're, I don't know, not ripe or something. And the, the leaves are, are, are declining. So we're seeing lots and lots of berries. But uh, God just providing for these birds for, for later on. Well, the berries are bearing fruit. See? Not, not that we want to eat those. I don't think it might even not be good for us. But the birds enjoy it. And um, they're not, uh, not eating it yet. But the fruit bearing, we understand that. <clears throat> um, and if it's not what we call fruit, you know, peaches and apples and stuff. Uh, it could be any grain bearing the, the, the wheat germ or uh, the oat or whatever. Those, that's the fruit that it's bearing. Now, how do we become fruit bearing? Well, we're actually told in the area of our character that the fruit of the Spirit working through us is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, he gives us nine things that blossom out of our lives. We don't have to work hard at that. What we work at is defeating self and walking according to what the Holy Spirit wants. Then something happens by the way that, that we begin to love and have joy, a deep-seated joy. And we have a peace. And when people are irritating, we become long-suffering. We just suffer with them and let them run out of their irritating activity. Um, so this is the idea um, that we bear fruit internally. But there's another way of bearing fruit, and that is sharing, as Christ did with the woman at the well, for instance, saying, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. And if you receive me, I will cause living water to come out of you, spiritual water, and you will have eternal life. The, uh, the artesian well, you don't have to bring the bucket down, bring it up, and then, oh, I've, I've used all the water, the, used up all the well water. No, this is artesian well, just keeps springing forth. 
So you take all the water you need, and then you move, and somebody else can come up. Well, the th idea is that uh, spiritual life boils up, bubbles up in us when we get saved. And it's never ending. It's an eternal life. So we live forever, but we also have that to give to others. Now, what he did was she, be she accepted him as the Messiah. And then what did she do? She ran over and talked to all the men of the uh, Samaritan village and said, I've met the man who told me everything in, in, in my entire life. He's a miracle man. And he's the Messiah. And you need to. So then they went and talked to him. They came back and he said, now we believe, not just because of what you said, but because we've talked to him ourselves. And that's the idea of witnessing what we've experienced and giving it to other people saying, I've got a story you ought to hear. I was this, and then I became that. Uh, God has saved me for his namesake. And then we encourage them to accept Christ as well. So become fruit bearing. Here's what he says in John 15. We'll look at 7 and 8 and then verse 16. If ye abide in me, live in me, make your abode, make your residence in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. We have that, that ultimate granting of request again. Herein is my Father glorified. This is what glorifies my Father, that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples, my uh, followers, uh, those who accept the discipline of my life. Now verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. They were the disciples. He went by and said, come follow me. I have chosen you and ordained you, given them the commission that you should go and bring forth fruit. Fruit in their life, fruit by bringing others to Christ. And that your fruit should remain, these people really get saved, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So, <clears throat> breaking this down a bit, Number one, asking for help in spreading the gospel. You see, this is the abide in me and my words abide in you. John Gill said, abiding in Christ is here explained by his words or doctrines abiding in his disciples, by which are meant his gospel, his good news, and the truths of it. So again, what we see here, while he doesn't say in that phrase, Ask in my name, I'll give it to you. He says, if you are asking in this goal of fruit bearing, I will give it to you. So he's saying the same thing, just in different words. So again, when we're in the business of fulfilling Christ's commission, you see the idea of bringing the gospel to everybody, he guarantees giving what we need to properly fulfill the great commission it must be done according to his word. So we are doing what he says, but we're doing it according to the way he says it. You see, There are people that are using deceptive methods to try to build a church. See, And the great goal is not building a bigger church. The goal is bringing people to Christ. And that should be done with his word. The second thing we see in this passage is glorifying the Father, in, or not in this passage, yes, in this passage, glorifying the Father in bringing others into his family. This is, this is the idea. Here's what he says. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Now, why does this glorify the Father? Because remember that it was God's purpose when he created man. Why did he do that? Did he need it? He didn't need anything, but he wanted it that he might bring them into his family of love. Love was the motive of God to create because he would have other intelligent beings that could accept his love and love him back, be in that love relationship, and um, they would expand the triune family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
loving each other, glorifying each other. Now we have thousands upon thousands coming in, expanding that family, expanding the love relationship. Um, Romans 8, 29, for whom he, God the Father, did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now, throw out all the Calvinist stuff you've heard about predestination. What it means is plan beforehand. So because he foresaw that you would exist, he wanted to plan beforehand how they could be conformed to the image of his son. When we're not saved, we are in the hideousness of corruption, of rottenness. We are, we are rotting zombies <laughs> and um, horrible to God. I'm thinking they're trying to translate zombie into Amharic. I'm not sure. I don't know how that works. You have to watch TV to find out that. But he has to clean us up, make us Christ-like. That's what being holy is. That, why? That his son, that he, Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, this is a family picture. God wants a bigger family of loving members. And so he has to take us from being out of the family of Satan, abusive family, bring us into the family of God, and that by the sacrifice of Christ. So the final goal, many brethren. So this is bringing glory to God by fulfilling the very purpose of mankind being created. All right, the th third passage that will take us into chapter 16, he speaks of glory to the Father through speaking in the place of Jesus. In the place doesn't mean to go stand in Jerusalem. It means in his stead, in his place. Um, you're speaking as he spoke, but it's not him speaking. You're speaking in his place. All right. John 16. We'll look at 23, 24 and 26, 27. And in that day, <clears throat> and he's talking about after I leave and you be involved, uh, you shall ask me nothing. Well, he wouldn't be around, would he? Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, you're not asking him anymore, you're asking the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now he says, he explains, hitherto, up to this time, have ye asked nothing in my name. They didn't come and say, Christ, would you explain the parables in the name of Christ? <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. You're talking to him. You don't ask in his name. He says, you've never done that before. However, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. So here he expands uh, the, the joy of working for him, working in his program with joy. Now 26, 27, at that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. He says, I don't have to be your intermediate then if you're asking my name. You go straight, straight to the Father and ask this in my name, and he'll give it to you. He says, for the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me. We love Christ. God the Father loves those who love his Son and have believed that I came out from God. Believe the message that I am the Son of God. So, Jesus spoke to the disciples of the time when he would be gone from them. Now, while he was with them, they would not ask in his name, but would just ask him directly. Then, when he's gone, they could no longer ask him directly. Yet, if they ask the Father in his name, that is, pray to the Father for the work Jesus called them to do, the Father will be pleased to grant all their requests. So, the Father has accepted them as his children. He loves them because of their love of Jesus. This is the way we get into the family. Notice salvation is here defined 
and I, I love the simplicity of it. What is salvation? When are you saved? Defined as loving Jesus and believing his deity, that he came from God the Father. You believe that he is what he said and that what he has done counts for you. So that's the first part of the message. We only have two parts, so don't get scared. But uh, the first part is that he is explaining to us this concept that when we are engaged in the work of discipling, which is the Great Commission, disciple all nations, then we need something. We need a safe place. We need, uh, we need Bibles. We need something. He said, if you ask, in my name, according to my authority, according to my program, I will give you everything you need. Everything you ask, I'll give it. And that is his promise. And over and over again, through the years, we've seen this happen. We've seen people uh, seeking to really uh, accomplish what God has called us to do and um, sharing then these requests to God and property was given. And um, or made available, and money for property was made available, and so on. We've just seen it through through all the years. Now, the second point is this: we want to pray with Jesus, and we'll go on then to chapter 17, called sometimes the high priestly prayer, though uh, you know that's kind of a glorious name, but um, this doesn't seem to actually be part of his sacrifice or his taking the blood to heaven, the, the ascension, uh, just, just his personal relationship. In fact, it's uh, not to become all mystical, but what we're seeing here is Christ the Son speaking to God the Father uh, in, in such a personal way that we, don't, we can't pray like this. We're not, we're not Christ, even though we're seeking to become like him. Uh, but we, we find here that he's talking about something very personal. And um, part of this is what he's asking personally of God. Now, there will be a lesson in this for us. And I'll be sharing that with you as we are emboldened, we are prompted to ask in some the same way. All right, let's see. First of all, the first passage is, that Jesus asked to be restored to glory. Let's read the passage first, John 17, 1 to 5. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. What hour? Well, this is when he was going to be taken, nailed to a cross, and killed, you see. Glorify thy son. The hour is here. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also may glorify thee. For me to accomplish the purpose I was sent here, to die for people's sins, that will bring glory to you because it was your plan. As thou hast given him, himself, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is that work of salvation. God giving Christ as the payment for sin, opens up the uh, possibility of people avoiding the damnation forever in the lake of fire. So he says, you, this is paying for their sins in a way that doesn't involve them being in hell forever. And as we have made the connection, I have given those people the eternal life. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. You see, again, he's the way. It is not knowing him alone that is salvation. It is knowing him that then reveals the Father. <clears throat> they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He's imagining that the work's all done, that he's de dead and risen from the dead. 
And now, O Father, glorify thou me, and notice this, with thine own self. Uh, bring your, your self into me. With the glory which I had with thee before the world was, before creation. What an amazing thought. Here he knows what it was like before the world was. And it was just them, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that glory that they had of one another, just that, that perfect love relationship, honoring one another. <clears throat> so it pictures here for us that Jesus left heaven to become a man on earth. He existed before he was born. We begin our existence at that moment of conception. We begin our life, and it begins a life that is lasting forever, somewhere, either heaven or hell. But uh, when uh, our, our existence begins at the time that our first uh, cell was created. John 3.13, no man, Christ is saying, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Even though he had limited the use of his godly powers, Part of that couldn't be eliminated. He existed everywhere. Even while he was on earth, he existed in heaven. That's what he says, which is in heaven. But he came down from heaven. So uh, that's where he came from. He existed before he was born. Then 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, uh, what is the definition of rich? What about that you have everything, everything is yours, and anything you want, you just say it, and it happens, you know, ultimate richness. Yet for your sakes he became poor. He set it aside. He came, became a baby on earth, baby with limited powers. He, he became a, a child of, of a poor people in a poor village. And, um, you know, when James came along, he probably had to share his bed with him, stuff like that. He became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich, that he would take us into that wealth of heaven. And then Philippians 2, 5 to 7, let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What attitude is that? Who, being in the form of God, being God himself, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If I'm God, I, there's nothing wrong with being equal with God. But <clears throat> made himself of no reputation. Literally, he emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? Of the privileges to use the godly powers for himself. Now he had to live life as you and I live life. We can't create bread out of stone, so he wouldn't, you see. And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And so his very coming was a change from uh, his heavenly activity. So he was limited, you see, while he was here. Self-imposed limitation. But after his resurrection, Jesus was returned to the fullness of his power and authority. We read this in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16 to 18, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. He said, after I die and resurrect, I'll meet you at this mountain. He pointed it out to them. The angels reminded uh, the women to tell the men where uh, to go to that mountain and you meet them there. See? Now, he met them other places unannounced, but here at the mountain, that was where I think the 500 gathered um, to, because that was the only place they could count on him being there. And so he came. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, here's his introduction to the Great Commission, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He says, I'm back. I'm back to the power that I had before I set it aside to be human. Now I'm back being God. So he always was God, but uh, now he had full control of it. So we learn from his prayer that it is acceptable for us to ask for our heavenly home at the end of our faithful service to him. The attitude is, I have 
followed it. Now I'm going to follow it to the end. I've accomplished what you sent me to do. Now glorify me uh, as we intended. And so you get to the end, you know, you're too old to continue, too sick to continue to well, something. And uh, you say, Lord, uh, it's it'll be great for you just to take me home. Let the ridiculous inabilities that I'm shackled with just drop away and I'm free to be with you in heaven. So he did it. It's acceptable for us to ask for our heavenly home at the end of our faithful service. The second passage is this. Jesus asked for the disciples to be strengthened. He wants them to be strong, to be mature. Here's John 17, 16 to 19. He says, I have manifested, literally made visible, thy name unto the men that thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, that I'm not doing this on my own, I came from you. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. They received them as words of God, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So that whole link, they understood it. I pray for them. I pray not for the world here, the unsaved. This is a special prayer for those who are saved. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. I am glorified in them. So Christ and the, Christ and the Father are one, and we, are, uh, we have joined them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I'm leaving them behind. And I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. He committed the care of the believers left on earth into his Father's hands, that they may be one as we are. This is a spiritual unity. When you read in the book of Acts, they were of one mind. They were of one heart. This was spiritual unity. He's not talking about an organizational unity, you see. He's talking about spiritual unity. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, he's talking about Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He was to be betrayed. So one of those people was the betrayer Judas. And he concludes by saying, And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world. He says, I going to leave them in this tough place, this hard place, this sin-cursed place. I'm going to leave them here, but I want you not to take them out, uh, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil, probably the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Once you get saved, you're not part of the world system anymore, see? Sanctify them, that is, make them holy through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In verses 18 and 19, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. That was the Great Commission. He had a job to do in the world. He was doing it. Now he gave us a job, sort of a tag team thing, and he gave us the job. He's leaving. And for their sakes... I sanctify myself, separate myself in holiness, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Or it could be translated, or that they might be truly sanctified, truly made holy, truly made Christ-like. So he's asking for God to keep them, strengthen them. He's worried about them in that sense as he leaves. So we learn from this that we are emboldened to ask for our work of witnessing 
and those that we lead to Jesus to be effective. We want the work that we do to be effective. And finally, Jesus asks for our unity in life and death. And the word our doesn't mean just us as all the saved people. He's talking about us today. Notice this, John 17, 20, 26. Neither pray I for these alone. Who is that? The disciples that were there. Neither pray I for these alone, but I'm also praying for them also which shall believe on me through their word. <laughs> Robin, that's you. He was praying for you. Perhaps God giving him the ability to see all of us believers today and forever. And what are you praying? That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. This is spiritual unity of one heart. See? That they also may be one in us, spiritual unity. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Perfect is matured, completed. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. As the father loves a child, God the father loved his son, but would sacrifice him for us to show his love for us. So we show the harmonious love of God by loving one another. You see. He continues then, the last two verses, Father, last three, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. <laughs> this means he was praying that we would see him in his heavenly glory when we die, when we go to where he is. We see him not as the Jesus in his sandals walking down a dusty road. We see him in all his glory, the, the shining glory of God. 25 and 26, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that the love wherein thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. <laughs> Wonderful to see. He was praying for us. Knew we would be here, and he prayed for us. So, in this example, we are emboldened to ask for the unity of love in our church and with other believers around the world. Jesus has placed his glory in us. That's happened already. And it will be revealed that glory will actually shine in our heavenly home. We know this from 1 John 3, 2. Listen to this. Beloved, John says to his fellow Christians, now are we the sons of God. We don't die and become a son of God. We are a child of God now, you see because we're saved. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We look like regular people, but we're different. But we know that when he shall appear, this is the rapture of the church, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There is something about that connecting. that When we see him, we take on that glorious shine. At that moment, Jesus' prayer will be answered fully. We find uh, this spoken of in, back in Daniel, Daniel 12, 3. And they that be wise, or those who are teachers, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. That's the sun and the moon and the stars. And they that turn many to righteousness, those who are fruit-bearing, will shine as the stars forever 
and ever. That's a long, long time. So we know that Christ will find the answer to his prayer. I thought that was fun to listen to what Christ says about our prayers and the praying about his program and our involvement in it, and then listening to him pray and understanding that we have that same privilege. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to hear these words, to understand that they have been guaranteed to be true because you breathed out these words that were written by uh, the people, uh, the Apostle John in this case. We ask, Father, that you might help us then to recognize that it's all true and that it is profitable for us. Therefore, we need to learn what Christ said about our prayer and how we can't use it, we can't spend this frivolously on the things that we just want or that others want, but that your goal is furthering your program on this earth, seeing people get saved, seeing churches established, seeing missionaries sent all around the world. And when we pray to further that goal, you promise to answer everything we need. We also see, Father, that in Christ's personal request to you, it is all right for us to look for the glory to come. It's all right for us to recognize we can pray for the strengthening always to your glory and not our own. And that we today can recognize he prayed for us to be kept and to uh, one day stand with you there in heaven and to shine even as the stars shine. And we thank you for it. With heads bowed, eyes closed, it may be you're saying, I don't know for sure that if I were to die today, I would go to heaven to be with the Lord. I would like to be sure. I would like to know this, that death that may come upon me at any time will be fulfilled by salvation in Christ. I would like to know this for sure, as the Bible says that I can. If you say, I've never received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've never humbled myself and said, I need what you alone can give. I think I can just handle it on my own. God, you go your way. I'll go mine. And you reject him. You reject his offer of salvation. My friend, you don't know, but every good and every perfect gift comes from God. And when you reject him, you reject everything that's good, everything that's perfect. And you will be left in some strange corner of the universe in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone because that's what happens when you're without God forever. If you would say, Pastor, I'd like to know for sure that I'll go to heaven, that I'll shine with Jesus forever. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Say, pray for me. I need the salvation that Christ offers. And the only way I can get it is through him. The only way I can be led to the Father is through Christ. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Father, you have given us then the privilege of knowing that we can be saved, that we can love you, we can know that you are true. But Father, if we reject it, then this day, this message will stand as a witness against them to say, I never heard, but they did. We pray thy blessing then as each of us who are saved reach out to others, seek to bring them to Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.